Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this important discussion about U.S.-led development initiatives in Central America, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras specifically. We're joined today by some very important guests, including those leading the U.S. initiatives to promote development and prosperity in a region very important to U.S. security. To get us started, I'm going to pass things on to our keynote speaker, Mauricio Claver-Caroni, who serves as a special assistant to the president and senior director for Western Hemisphere Affairs at the National Security Council. Over the weekend, uh, he became the first U.S. citizen who was elected to become president of the American Development Bank. We at AEI certainly congratulate him on his historic victory and look forward to his tenure at the IDB, where he will continue his work promoting prosperity in the Americas at this very pivotal, pivotal moment in our region's history. Good morning, Mauricio. Hey, Roger, thank you so much. And, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, thank you for your leadership while, while in government and your continued leadership uh, throughout. And, and this obviously is a great example uh, of that. Uh, we're extraordinarily proud of the partnership we've had with the countries of, of Central America, of Northern Central America. You know, one of the things I'll first start by saying, I don't say Northern Triangle uh, in particular, because one of the things that we did uh, uh, early on is essentially eliminate the use of the term uh, Northern Triangle. And part of the reason we did that is because uh, uh, not that, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, for the sake of efficiency, Congress can be too efficient. So you kind of bunch countries up and you say, hey, let's just, let's, uh, let's assign a pot of money. Uh, and that's fine. We love, we love efficiency when it comes to bureaucracy and we love efficiency in Congress. Uh, but the reality is Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador are all three very different countries. Uh, as uh, for all, obviously uh, you know that, and, and I'm sure most of the viewers uh, know that, but uh, obviously they have different economies, they have different comparative advantages, they have different cultures, different people, different, uh, different needs uh, and different challenges. Uh, and one of the things that we did and when we, when we created our America Grecia initiative, which first and foremost focused on really breaking the, the, the bottlenecks for private sector investment, particularly the energy and, and infrastructure finance uh, and infrastructure finance projects in that regards was really to, to, to be very granular. Uh, each agreement that we've signed, each framework that we've signed through our America Grecia initiative with, uh, with the governments and we've, and we've done so uh, with, with, with Honduras and El Salvador, uh, the Guatemala one is gonna be done now uh, fairly soon. Uh, one, of, one of the things that we've done in that regard is become very granular so that we can learn what are the specific needs in that country, what are the opportunities that lie in that country, uh, uh, so that we can uh, be effective and impactful, and we're not just doing a little bit here, a little bit there. Uh, the other thing we learned, now that I say that, is, is, is through these frameworks that, you know, the, the people kept asking me about when during this uh, election for IDB, uh, obviously about big bureaucracies and how we felt about dealing them, making them more efficient, more effective. And I always used to answer, I was like, have you not heard of the United States government? And uh, one of the things that we learned early on was the fact that, you know, each agency of the U.S. government, whether it was, you know, USAID, whether it was TDA, with Treasury, Commerce, you name it, was all, everybody's doing great things in each country. They're doing fantastic things like the State Department, the, 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 the five different bureaus of the State Department are doing great things in a particular country, but there wasn't cohesion. And, and the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. And the other thing we thought we, we sought to do to have greater impact and be more efficient and impactful was really bring cohesion uh, in that sense. So we've done that and we've had good success uh, in, 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 in doing so and in, and in doing these frameworks. And we've had tremendous uh, a, a relationship with the three governments uh, in kind of taking a, a you know, we, we tried to do something different. Uh, all of you obviously are familiar with the Alliance for Prosperity that was began by the, by, by the previous administration. And, you know, my ongoing joke was that it brought a little bit of an alliance and no prosperity. And the, the reality of that is that there was, you know, essentially it was, it was a lot of shiny objects. It was, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a, a, you know, pots, pots of money that were never going to be used, which because, because they had, you know, impossible conditionality uh, put towards it. And look, we all want to be aspirational and I'm all for aspiration, but there is also kind of also a reality. And as a result, we saw that it didn't work. I mean, it led, there was a, a, a huge migration crisis uh, and it didn't have uh, the impact that it was well-intentioned uh, in, in its creation and, and it sought to do, but, but, it, wasn't, uh, um, but it wasn't effective, let's just, let's, let's just be honest. Uh, so what we did was essentially to, you know, flip things around. You know, first we sought to work with the three governments in Northern and Central America to uh, really stem the tide and 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 break the loopholes that were feeding 
uh, illegal uh, migration. And we did that. And that's not the subject of this conversation. Uh, but then what we did after that was we delivered on a promise. And we said, if we can stop that, then the next step is to really work together to, to really create a private sector-led investment uh, into those countries. And look, each of those countries face challenges, governance challenges, corruption challenges. We all know that. Um, but one thing is to tell the country, and this is just kind of, you know, a, 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 um, um, maybe now is not the time to kind of go into my personal philosophy too much in this, but, you know, I, I truly believe, you know, that there is no greater force to fight against corruption than U.S. companies and U.S. private sector. You know, it's embedded in the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. You know, like, like when they, when a U.S. company comes to a, a, a country, essentially they bring with them the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And in doing so, and by us creating through the DFC, uh, and we've now signed uh, as part of this agreement, uh, $1 billion commitments with, we've done with Guatemala, Honduras, and we're going to do now with El Salvador as well. Um, it essentially gives you the opportunity to say, hey, look, it's here. Here it is. It's like it's 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 you're, you're, here, here's what the cookie smells like, and, and it's really good, and you can have it with milk, but don't screw it up. And at that point, it's not about preaching and saying, oh, if you reform your whole system and if you you know get an A plus, then you know the potential of investors are going to somehow fall upon you. It's essentially saying, hey, look, here they are. We solved the short term problem. Here's the long term solution. We have the incentives. Here's, here it is. Here's what the cookie looks like. Here's what it smells like. Now, you know, are you going to take it and, 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 and with it take our Foreign Pro Practices Act and everything, which is going to, everything's going to be to the benefit of your people, or are you going to say, no, you know, let's, let's, you know, walk away and screw it up. That's, you know, an issue of, of responsibility there in that sense. So I think that's been a, a very, very, very important. Uh, what brings us here uh, is obviously uh, 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 the work, the work of uh, the new DFC uh, commitment, uh, the first commitment of the U.S. government uh, with Cabe, and that's extraordinarily important. Look, uh, I take my hat off to to my friend Dante uh, has done great work. Uh, 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 we and, and even in my, you know, I'm still a U.S. government official, but even after October 1st, uh, we are not competitors; we are uh, allies. And the way I see it, if, if an entity does uh, a, a a better uh, a better job in a subregion. Then you know we need to we need to go with whoever is being the most effective. That's by the way that's competition. That's a great thing. You know whoever is doing the best job uh, needs to work with them. And and I'm not uh, Dante. Don't get excited. I'm not saying that the United States should join uh, Cabe uh, at this point and maybe you know maybe maybe in the future. But uh, but I do think that I commend you for the good work you're doing. I think that this uh, commitment from the United States to help uh, to work with Cabe is historic. Uh, and, 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 and it's important because you have a sense of granularity in the region uh, that, that, frankly, others don't have, although IDB is going to uh, catch up and pass you pretty soon, uh, or so I hear. And, and so, so I think that's extraordinarily important. The focus of that, and I'll, and I'll shut up after this, the focus of that, though, and I think that the, where the real opportunity lies and also where the crisis lies, is in small, medium-sized businesses. You know, I've, I've now argued ad nauseum, you know, the, the secret sauce for the United States is not that complicated. We're the number one recipients of foreign direct investment in the world. It's good to be attractive for a foreign investment. You know, like we talk about, oh, you know, the imperialism of US foreign investment. No, we are the recipient. The number one country in the world that receives foreign direct investment is the United States. That's part of our secret sauce. The other part of our secret sauce is small, medium-sized businesses, that they are the motor of our economy. And that's good. There's a third one, which is like intranational mobility. Uh, and, and, but anyway, that's a whole other issue, which I think also is important uh, for Central America, but we'll, we'll, I'll save that uh, uh, for, for another time. Um, so small and medium-sized enterprises are uh, not only the motors of our economy, but they should be the motors of, of, of the economies uh, in, 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 in Northern Central America. In part of my presentation Saturday to the IDB, I said, look, you know, I come from, you know, Miami. I was born in Miami. I've seen first and foremost, firsthand, what uh, the many diasporas of every single country that is a member of, uh, of the IDB, I have seen what every single one of those regional members, what their diasporas can do when essentially given uh, the ability to innovate, when, you know, they all, you know, no one works harder than, than communities and the peoples of those, of those countries. 
and when they don't face endless bureaucracy and uh, and then corruption and things of the sort. Um, the most successful entrepreneurs in those countries are in those countries, you know, and we just need, they need to have the ability to do so. One of those is access to capital and particularly the most vulnerable groups. Uh, a statistic that I've now raised ad nauseum uh, in this campaign and throughout, Latin America and the Caribbean has the biggest shortfall of financing for small and medium-sized businesses in the world, in the world. It is the region of the world with the biggest financing gap for small, medium-sized businesses. That is increased another 50% for women uh, who, and other vulnerable groups. And in Central American countries, some of the minority groups, indigenous groups, uh, the, the, Afri the, the groups of African heritage on the coasts, uh, et cetera. Um, and yet, statistically, small, medium-sized businesses owned by women have 10% higher income than those owned by men. So, and now with COVID, obviously all of that is uh, inverse. I think Cabe has done a great job, knows those countries, knows the, knows, uh, the communities. Uh, we need to increase the secret. The sauce is clear, small, medium-sized businesses, growth, access to capital. Uh, those, you know, Cabe knows that. We're happy to be a part of that, uh, helping uh, particularly the most vulnerable that don't have access to it, which ironically happened to also be the most successful. So it's like win, 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 win. I like, we all love to win, 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 win. And I'm gonna shut up now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mauricio. I, I understand that you um, won't be able to stay with us for very long, but I wanna thank you very much for the opening comments, setting the context for the challenge we're facing. Uh, which is great, and uh, your enthusiasm for the uh, for the challenge, uh, and certainly the uh, new role that you'll be playing, that will uh, certainly make a huge difference uh, for all of us, for the uh, for the Americas as a whole. And we want to thank you again for joining us to getting us started this morning, and and uh, and we'll definitely all be in touch. We know we know where to reach you. Please do. I, I need it. <laughs> thank you very okay, much. Guys, thank you very much. End of Mauricio. Ciao. Thank you guys. So I want to start by wishing uh, our viewers from Central America Happy Independence Day. Uh, and we want to thank uh, Juan Jose Dabu for joining us uh, and Dante Monste for joining us from Central America on, on your on National Independence Day. Uh, let me just get us started by explaining uh, our, our format and introducing our panelists. Uh, we uh, are joined uh, by Andrew Herskowitz, who serves as Chief Development Officer at the International uh, Development Finance Corporation of the US government. This is a successor to OPIC. And Andrew is standing, uh, sitting in for uh, Andrew Bowler, who's at uh, the White House for an important event. And we all understand that uh, uh, there is um, there are a few challenges uh, that, that you have to confront when you're in government. And certainly when you get a call from the White House, that is the first thing you need to do. Uh, we're also joined by Mr. Dante Mosi, who is the uh, executive president of CAVE, uh, the Central America Bank for Economic Integration, uh, which is uh, based in his native Honduras. Uh, Timothy Xiang serves as Secretary General of Taiwan's International Cooperation Development Fund. And we're pleased to have him join us. And uh, our colleague here at AEI, Juan Jose Dabub, a visiting fellow uh, at AEI, who has decades of experience uh, as a successful businessman in Central America and is an important uh, uh, contributor to the discussions uh, in the, at the international level uh, about economic development and, 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 and not limited to Central America, but globally as well. Their full bios are available on, on our website. Uh, and before I uh, start asking them uh, initial questions, I want to invite your questions, uh, which we'll get to uh, uh, after a first uh, round of uh, discussions with the panel. Uh, please uh, feel free to send your questions uh, using the hashtag Central America Prosperity on Twitter or by sending an email to our colleague Andres.Martinez at AEI.org. Uh, Andrew, uh, thank you very much for sitting in. You're a uh, development professional, uh, uh, detailed to DFC from USAID, you know, the Central America region very, very well. Uh, please tell us, uh, how do you see things uh, as a professional in this area? Uh, what new uh, resources uh, does DFC bring to the table? And how do, this, how do these new initiatives, new strategies uh, potentially make a difference in the future of uh, a region that's so important to our security. 
Thanks, Roger. Really excited to be here. This is actually, I say, almost 30 years in the making. About almost 30 years ago, I was a volunteer in a small fishing village in Nicaragua. And one of the things that I noted, I was very skeptical about the role of government when I first got down there. I just graduated from Georgetown University. And then one day after being in this small village for about six months, a bunch of trucks arrived and suddenly every, it was a USAID project and it was to build roads. It was all dirt roads in the village. And for three weeks, every able-bodied individual in that town was suddenly employed. And they built these roads that went through the town. And then what I was fascinated with was what happened afterwards. Because everybody had some money in their pocket, one of the fishermen went out and bought a cooler so he could store his fish and start selling things directly to, to the buyers rather than having to work through a middleman. Another person went and bought a refrigerator and started selling Cokes and beers and things like that and built a small kiosk. And I saw how the small injection of capital made people start uh, creating, uh, cre creating these small businesses and how it improved their, their lifestyles remarkably. Now, 30 years later, here I am able to really play a role in helping implement those types of projects and making sure that these consumers, that these small businesses are able to get access to capital. And that's exactly what DFC is trying to focus on. We're really excited about this letter of intent that we're signing with Cabe to provide $100 million which we hope will benefit ultimately small and medium enterprises and women as well. We're excited about the billion dollars that we've already committed to Guatemala and a billion dollars to Honduras. And we're working on something for El Salvador as well. Um, we can't tell you how much uh, pleased we are that, um, uh, that, that Taiwan has, is working with Cabe as well on this. To have Taiwan as a partner is a great honor for us. Um, but really, Latin America, it already is one of the largest portfolios for DFC. We've got $8.5 billion in active commitments there. But one of the things that we've been doing since COVID hit is we've really been focusing on trying to get money into the hands of people as quickly as possible. There's nothing more developmental that you can do when a disaster hits or a pandemic than making sure that people themselves, the small businesses, get access to capital. One of the experiences that I had when I was living, you know, covering living in the Caribbean is a hurricane would hit every single year. And it shocked me that, that what happened was the larger banks would often sit on their capital because most of their clients were the big construction companies and hotels who all had insurance. So they were sitting on this excess liquidity. And then a lot of the smaller banks and the microfinance institutions had a huge run on their deposits because the people wanted to quickly rebuild and get going. And so we wanted to design something where we could get capital liquidity from the larger banks to the smaller banks. That's exactly how, what we've been doing with our COVID response is we've been trying to get liquidity into the hands of people so they can get small loans and rebuild their businesses and get working capital. So we're really happy to be here. We're very excited about this opportunity and we promise to continue to do great things in this region. And happy Independence Day to all of our colleagues in Central America. Let me ask uh, questions of our uh, uh, other panelists, and we'll come back around to you, Andrew, for some follow-up. But uh, uh, Dante Mossi of Cabe, uh, Andrew mentioned an investment uh, on the part of the uh, DFC that is that they have uh, have an intention to uh, to back your activities in the region. And uh, as a professional there in the Central American region, uh, understanding how the private sector works, what the challenges you're confronting now in the midst of this pandemia. How do you see this infusion of US resources uh, being a game changer potentially uh, in uh, jumpstarting Central American economic growth uh, as we pull out of this crisis? Oh, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, no, thank you for all the greetings. Uh, we're very happy to work with DFC. I think this is a historical opportunity Central America has been a partner of the U.S. and Taiwan for many, many years. And, um, and I think it, this is important because uh, Cave uh, reacted with a $2 billion response to the emergency. And we included a window to help the private sector, particularly the small and medium enterprise. And uh, with very soft terms uh, that were not commercially available. So having the support of Taiwan, ICDF, and uh, and the U.S. is, is, is just fantastic news. Uh, we have been starting the, the program already, and uh, I, I got to tell you, some commercial banks and uh, local uh, co-ops are telling us 
is this true? Uh, what's the trick behind it? So, uh, and it's not, I mean, we're, we're sending the message. We are very concerned about businesses that were closed for five months and they had to fire people because they didn't have any sales. So we are offering working capital for these companies that stopped. And um, on top of that, Cave put from its own profits uh, a guarantee fund. So we can guarantee up to 75% of the loan uh, to these small and medium enterprise companies. And uh, the, when we are you know, spreading the word with uh, Guatemala, El Salvador and Honduras, this is possible. This is something that the small and medium enterprise should actually do and take this challenge and become an opportunity to do business better, uh, to uh, you know, manage biosecurity, for example, uh, because we will need to work in an environment in which COVID will be present, but we need to continue with our work and generate jobs. And uh, so um, having the private sector uh, window in this uh, larger program has become really, uh, you know, a message of hope. I had the opportunity to chat with the three presidents and they are more than happy that uh, Cave was present so fast and available to uh, give a hand to a small companies that otherwise wouldn't have, you know, that quick response that will uh, be able for people getting out of home and going to look for a job to find one. So we're very pleased to having this uh, partnership with the US, which I should say is the first one ever. So thank you a lot DFC for this uh, a sign of support, we're very grateful. And for Taiwan as well, uh, this alone partner was the first international partner outside the region Cave had. So it's, it's also a very long trusted friend that, uh, you know, we rely on them heavily uh, to do these very difficult, uh, quick actions in, in hard times. Well, thank you. Very yeah, much. I, will add, I will add that this is also exciting for us because this is one of the first times that we're providing this type of financing to an entity that has this type of sovereign connection. And we're looking at this to see how we can do this to benefit uh, folks in the rest of the world as well. Sure, Ground groundbreaking by all means. And those of us who know Cave, uh, the role it plays, uh, are not surprised that you folks saw an opportunity to, to leverage uh, their uh, credibility, their technical capacity uh, and, and uh, understanding of the region. Uh, well, there are a few countries in the world uh, in a better place to talk about uh, democratic capitalism than uh, Taiwan. Uh, and uh, for people like me who've been involved in the region of Central America for so long, uh, where we see their flag, we see uh, freedom and opportunity and great, great partners. And there's no, no good, no friends like uh, old friends. And we welcome uh, Mr. Sheng here to tell us a little bit, a little bit about your engagement of Central America, your continuing interest in Latin America as a whole. But how do you see the challenges? What uh, resources are you folks uh, bringing to bear? And uh, what can you tell us about uh, 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 jump-starting uh, economic growth in a region that's uh, that we have a shared interest in. Thank you, uh, because you know Central America is very important to Taiwan, especially there are some diplomatic allies over there, and so for so many years, uh, I Taiwan SDF because we saw for the ODA, so we already conduct uh, different kind of technical assistance projects. Well, take for example, in Guatemala, we have the projects for the development of SME. Also, we have the bamboo industrial projects. And in Honduras, we have a project for the avocado seedling production. Also, we have the pig breeding and reproduction projects. All these projects for the benefit of the peoples in those countries. So that's our main concern is development agencies. So that's the main goal that we're trying to support our partner countries to improve their life, to improve their development of economic and social aspects. So that's what we've done so far. And that's our goal we're trying to do from the beginning. And also as the, Mr. Moses just said, in recently, not only bilateral efforts, actually we're trying to work with uh, Kabe, trying to input more for helping those countries in Central America. The reason why we respond immediately when the CABE uh, initiates the programs for the COVID-19. And also based on our experience, we 
choose the component three and component five, which is for the public sectors and the private sectors, to end the with the loan of 50, 40, 50 million and 80 million US dollars, respectively. So it means the total 130 million US dollars is the capitals and all resources we're trying to input into the region. And we hope this support will definitely it will be critical for the government or the country's members to, to change to improve their health systems, also to mitigate the impact of the local peoples. So for the region, just because so close to us in terms of the friendships. So from the beginning, we're trying to do our best, not only in the area just to mention technical assistance, also other areas like the training, or the healthcare assistance, all those projects, it have, what we have done so far, not to mention the one I just said, the input of the capital to the Kabe. Well, great, great story. I'm glad to hear that you folks are on top of the problem and working with a uh, good friend so, in Central America uh, to make a difference. That's a, it's just a very good message so far, and I'm sure we'll hear even uh, more from Juan Jose Dawub, our colleague here at AEI. We're proud to have him with us. But uh, in addition to being an international development uh, expert, renowned in that field, having worked at the World Bank and other places, uh, he's a Central American businessman. Uh, he knows uh, uniquely uh, what the challenges are uh, on the ground uh, and uh, can assess the potential impact of the contributions being made by by the DFC, by Taiwan, by Kabe. Uh, so Juan Jose, what do you see the challenges today? Uh, you also, by the way, I understand played an important role in sort of shaping this America Crece framework that uh, the Trump administration is new, using now to great effect uh, in engaging the region. So what do you see the challenges are uh, today uh, for, and how do we mobilize these partners in the region to, uh, to take advantage of these opportunities? Thank you very much, Roger, and thank you to all the speakers today. Again, as uh, was mentioned before, happy uh, Independence Day for, for Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and the rest of Central America. Today is a great day uh, for all of us. Um, I, uh, I think that the America Crece uh, initiative is a timely and well thought out effort that fits perfectly in the current situation that our three countries are going through. Namely, uh, COVID-19 has uh, changed the dynamics significantly and has created challenges that were not present before. So in addition to what the countries were facing already, COVID-19 came and added a new layer of challenges. However, uh, America Crece has this uh, vision of supporting the private sector, supporting entrepreneurs. And the difference between America Crece and other initiatives that have taken place in the past is that uh, governments are temporary, whereas entrepreneurs and the private sector is permanent. And therefore, uh, bearing and, and, and supporting this particular endeavor and this particular sector is simply great. I think it's a fantastic opportunity that I'm sure that we will be able to capitalize on. So as uh, Mauricio said earlier, I think it is indeed a win, win, win. It is a win for the people of the region. It is a win for businesses in the United States. And I think it is a win for the security of the whole region uh, altogether. Why it is a win for the people of Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador? It is because post-pandemic, we need to re-energize our economies in a smart way through competitiveness, private sector job creation, and inclusive growth. In other words, the basis for development. At the same time, it is a win for businesses in the United States. Many of these resources are channeled and are executed with companies in the United States. That makes a relationship between the private sector in the United States and the private sector in Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, a way of, if nothing else, certify partners, certify suppliers at competitive prices next door to the United States. And third, it is a win, uh, of course, for the region as a whole from the security perspective, because in as more jobs, the private sector is able to create in Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, people from those three countries 
are more likely to search for their dream in our countries rather than having a need to come to the United States. So it also creates uh, a positive relationship between the four countries. So I think what President Trump uh, has done with this initiative and using DFC as the arm through which this is going to be possible with the support of um, uh, institutions like CABE yes, uh, in Central America, but also uh, uh, private banks in the region, which are at the end of the day, the ones that are closer to where the needs are, are going to be able to, in a much more efficient way, produce the result or create the conditions for the, for the results uh, to be uh, much more positive. So there are $3 billion that uh, DFC has uh, somehow allocated for Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador. There is this relationship with CABE. All of this will be uh, channeled through companies in the United States and in Central America and the banks. And I think this creates the right incentives to accelerate new opportunities in the region and indeed achieve such a win-win-win that I was mentioning before. So yes, we continue to face many challenges, the challenges that are proper from development, the challenges that have been imposed due to this foreign virus that came to, to, to bother all of us in Central America and here in the United States. But at the same time, we Central Americans are resilient people and we will be able to overcome these challenges and not only uh, come, uh, I believe, in a much stronger position, but be in a position to leapfrog from other countries in Latin America that do not have the geographical advantage of being door to the to, of being closer to the United States as we are. Mm -hmm. So we all know, uh, you know, ten years ago we signed an agreement, a trade agreement with uh, Central American countries and in, in the DR, uh, and uh, ten years later uh, conditions are appreciably, well, arguably not much better. Uh, so these agreements are not self-executing and it takes more than uh, a willing private sector. Certainly that's required, but it also, we also need to have the right environment in terms of uh, democracy, the rule of law, accountability. And so private sectors are sometimes uh, at the mercy of governments that are, that are corrupt uh, or aren't committed to, uh, to growth uh, in this way, in terms of spreading out economic opportunity, because it means empowering, in some cases, people that they regard as opponents. Uh, and so we, we see, Andrew, in the headlines uh, recently, uh, uh, you know, continued uh, 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 impressions of corruption uh, in, in the region. How do we use these new resources to, to leverage the kinds of policies by governments uh, to empower people so that they can hold their own governments accountable uh, and uh, demand the kind of conditions uh, for, uh, for doing business uh, and accountability from, from government leaders. Uh, how do we, uh, this diplomacy is still important, no? And, and how do we use this uh, leverage to bring about the better conditions uh, for, for the private sector to deliver, uh, uh, deliver on the promise of, of better jobs and prosperity. So the private sector investment is what's going to deliver really the anti-corruption model. And I like to compare sort of the US model versus the Beijing model, okay? Any company that's getting a loan from the United States, any construction project that the United States is supporting, you're gonna know number one, that the people coming to build that construction project are probably gonna be the vast majority are going to be local people from the countries and not imported labor from the United States versus the Beijing model where they'll often bring in their own labor. Number two, you're gonna see higher quality construction standards. You're gonna see because of just the general liabilities that we have, you're gonna see respect for intellectual property. And so a lot of that sharing intellectual property for whatever the project is gonna be locally, it's something that that's what the US model does. There's gonna be greater social standards. There's gonna be greater environmental standards. And then most importantly related to corruption, because I consider all of these things related to corruption. Corruption is not just stealing. Corruption is being abusive to local communities. Corruption is not respecting the environment and leaving behind a huge mess. The US, our investments bring all of those much higher standards than anything else. But then we also have compliance with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act as well. People go to jail. So I think any company 
that's doing business with the United States in Central America automatically gets this stamp of approval as a company that's been through very thorough due diligence and we've done our, our, our homework on them. And they also know that if they do slip up, there are repercussions for that. So I would just say that the U.S. model is one that really, really drives investment. And I, I bring it back to one of the comments that another one of our colleagues just made about how governments come and go, but the private sector is always there. This was my experience in Haiti about 20 years ago when I was trying to lobby USAID, not lobby, but trying to convince my colleagues at USAID to do the first loan guarantee programs in Haiti. And it was only six months after there had been a coup. And I explained to my colleagues back in Washington, I said, look, these businesses, these banks have been operating for 40 years with governments coming and going. If anybody understands the risks of doing business in these countries, it's these banks, they've been doing well. And sure enough, those loan guarantees move forward. There weren't any significant defaults and they're extremely successful. So this is why we have to use this economic diplomacy to using these transactions to drive the reforms. So Roger, I think you're muted. That's a great answer, Andrew. And uh, we need people like you working uh, in, in US government so they understand the central role of the private sector and, and uh, people who, are, who have the resources to back uh, economic solutions in their own countries. Uh, sometimes uh, I don't think that's very well understood. Um, I wanna go to Mr. Xiang to, to, to first to react uh, to some of the things Andrew was saying about the unique, uh, sort of mercantile, I would say exploitive role that, that the People's Republic of China pl uh, plays when it comes in and, and uh, in a very big way in some of these economies, the whole environmental degradation question, we didn't talk about that. But how do you see Taiwan potentially uh, changing that uh, in your day-to-day -day engagement with the region? I mean, what, what sort of model you bring in, in, in emphasizing uh, uh, local growth, uh, integral development, where the local uh, players can uh, uh, are central to the solutions that are being brought uh, uh, through these finance programs. Uh, sorry, uh, it seems not very clear to me. I mean, the question is because the voice is not very clear. So only I'm very sorry. I don't really follow your question. Yeah, I was just saying. Uh, what, uh, how, uh, what is your vision? How does it, how's it distinguished from the sort of, uh, you know, a lot of people think that PRC has sort of an exploitive uh, model in terms of how it engages in Latin America. Uh, how do you see the market, uh, democratic capitalism, uh, distinguishing in, in, in terms of economic development in these countries? Um, well, I, I would say because, well, from the perspective of Taiwan ICPF, because in ODA office, usually our focus mainly on the tech like technical assistance or other kind of assistance. So basically it's different from the model you just mentioned regarding the PRC. And uh, all I would say because uh, our projects mainly address the needs of local peoples. Of course, it's not different areas, not only uh, certain groups, it's the social levels or the community levels. So of course, uh, with our support, definitely will help their economic development, but definitely it's different from the methods or the way the PRC have done for its, I mean, this, their assistance. But I would say, uh, well, it's, it's a policy choice is a policy choice because the different influence on different sectors. So our assistance probably mainly on the locals, but probably the PRC's measures probably on the higher levels. But it depends on the how they feel, whether it is really developed economies. So I'm really, I don't really, I respond to your questions, but what I understand is that. I think you did, sir. I think you did. Very well. I think you appreciate. I appreciate your answer. And and Dante, uh, there at uh, Cave, from your standpoint, uh, you know, what are the unique challenges that we're facing in Central America today because of the COVID pandemic? 
what are the two or three things that you could see this infusion of capital making a difference? Well, first of all, I mean, one of the huge advantages of the Northern Triangle is that the three countries, uh, you know, they're very good at football, but, uh, and, but sometimes they're very good at coordinating policy. So they actually locked down uh, for the COVID-19. So uh, all the three countries actually have suffered uh, this, uh, you know, deliberate effort to stop the economies uh, altogether. So the challenge is, uh, okay, how do you restart your business? But uh, as I mentioned, how do you transform the challenge into an opportunity? So let me tell you one of the, uh, of the challenges that I, I see uh, going forward. Uh, and I look to the US for to this. Uh, we need uh, cheap energy prices. And uh, so some companies in Guatemala and Honduras are looking at new technologies uh, in, in Texas to generate uh, uh, electricity from natural gas, in, in compressed gas, they call. And uh, to me, it's amazing that small businesses are actually, uh, you know, struggling to find innovation and how to do things better and cheaper because they said we need to compete. So it's not that like we just need to restart, but we need to start better than we were doing before. So these opportunities are fantastic. The second one I think is fantastic. And this is an agreement that it was uh, made by the presidents of the of the region was to uh, you know insist on trade. Uh, we will shut down borders to people, but we will not shut down the border for trade and investment. So I think uh, the free trade agreement of Central America and uh, and the U.S. has worked, and uh, we have uh, uh, you know a U.S. customs office in Puerto Cortez and. Uh, which enables exports from Central America to enter to the U.S. as domestic uh, cargo. So this is a fantastic opportunity the U.S. has given it to, to the small entrepreneurs in the region. So this is a fantastic opportunity to uh, increase productivity. And uh, since Central America produces a lot of you know, tropical fruits and uh, basic man manufacturers, uh, this is actually something that is we are very competitive and uh, as a region, uh, we are way closer uh, to the US and China. So we can provide these fresh fish, fresh vegetables to the US uh, in a very you know, efficient way. And uh, so we need to uh, use these advantages that by law we already have. So we need to empower these businesses to, to look for those business opportunities. Uh, let me give you the last because I think I, I don't want to speak too, for too long, but uh, Central America produces good quality coffee. Uh, not the, the coffee as a commodity, but uh, the high quality coffees. And uh, so, and they're produced by small farmers in mountains, uh, mostly by indigenous uh, communities. And we were just chatting with uh, Mr. Juan Jose that sometimes these are very labor intensive activities and you don't find workers. So these are the type of uh, you know, product that uh, generates a lot of economic activity at the base. Uh, so you have even people with uh, you know, relatively uh, few skills uh, that find a job and they are empowered, they, are, they, they have access to to, to money and they can actually start uh, uh, you know, economic activity at the local level. So um, one of the efforts of uh, these uh, small um, and medium enterprise funds that we have, it's actually directed towards coffee growers because they have an ability to go into uh, indigenous communities, uh, into really rural areas and make people stay in, in their region and produce and be productive and, and you know, generate their own income and provide very good coffee to Andrew. So he wakes up in the morning very energetic. So, uh, so basically we want to really help out uh, these communities by helping them to be more competitive in the, in the world market. Andrew, you wanna hop in? Sure, look, I mean, one of the things that, that's really important to us, and I think I'm gonna get to this a little bit, but it's talking about why is, is this type of work that we do so important from a U.S. national security standpoint as well, but it's not just U.S. national security standpoint, it's for the national security for each of the countries in Central America. And essentially, people seek to migrate when there's one of three things going on. Either they're facing political, some sort of persecution, 
which isn't quite as common in most of the countries in this region. Um, two, maybe there's some healthcare crisis and they need to find you know, some healthcare, a better healthcare, and they want to travel someplace else. But really, what's the main reason? It's economic. And I can go back to my friends who I fortunately am in touch with from that little village in Nicaragua because of Facebook and reconnected with them probably about 15 years ago. And I'm able to tell you that, that many of them are still there, but when they do need to, they do try to come to the United States or go to Costa Rica, it's because there's been some economic crisis in the town. There's been a flood that came through and might've destroyed their, their, their fishing boat, uh, you know, their fishing boat uh, uh, business. And they need to go and figure out how to make money. That's the number one uh, driver for immigration. And this is where we can play. I mean, nobody wants to leave their home. I mean, unless you're living in a really rural area that has no basic services and you then try to want to move to the city, but people love their countries and they want to stay there. And anything that we can do to help them with uh, economic progress is something that we want to do. And what's the best way to do that? It goes back to what I was saying early on. It's getting money into the hands of people. It's getting money into the hands of small businesses, getting money into the hands of women, because I, someone said it's that women... At, it's like 10% greater returns with women-owned businesses. I've heard much greater statistics than that. And I've seen it firsthand. So we have to keep on doing these, these projects. We're helping build the infrastructure. We're getting countries access to inexpensive electricity so they can remain competitive, um, so they can compete, whether it's in the textile industry or any other industry on a global basis, that they can make sure that their prices or production are low and that we can give an opportunity for, for, for businesses and economies to grow. Excellent. Uh, Juan Jose, from your point of view, uh, I mentioned the opportunities by the FTAs. Of course, we're very proud of the, those, those agreements. Uh, how do we get the private sector in Central America to pull together uh, to, to access the market, to communicate with investors, to, to uh, push the internal reforms that are necessary to spread the benefits of economic growth to, to everybody uh, in, in their countries? I, I think, Roger, that's a great question. And, and let me first react to something that Andrew said, which is very important. In his first intervention, he mentioned uh, the example of Haiti. I had the chance to be in Haiti in 2010 to support uh, after the earthquakes. And then I had a chance to, to teach at Princeton. And I learned a lot about the model that at that time was being uh, implemented that Andrew described. And I think that's exactly the sort of approach we need, what DFC is doing in terms of bringing Citibank, Wells Fargo to work with local banks, for example, to be able to channel resources in those sectors and areas where the locals have the, the, the temperature of the patient much more uh, 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 null, known uh, for everybody. In terms of uh, your, your question, um, at the time we were negotiating CAFTA, we were basically sending the following message. We don't need a fish. We don't need to be taught how to fish. What we need is a market where to sell the fish. And that continues to be, I think, uh, the basis of what the private sector in our countries uh, have in terms of capacity to do and in terms of what they aspire to do in terms of being uh, a, a, a much bigger, a more significant uh, um, cooperator or, 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 or uh, access to the market in the United States. So at the macro level, CAFTA is a framework that can be working even better because I don't think we have taken full advantage of the opportunity that that represents. Also at the macro level, let's recognize that Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador are closer to Miami than Miami is to Washington, DC. This is just to help us focus how important it is not only to strengthen further the business, uh, and, but also from the security perspective. During COVID, the United States found out that having in Asia, primarily in China, uh, certain things being produced, even the most basic ones, uh, created some kind of tension and delays, and perhaps some life could have been saved should things have been closer to. So Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador are next door. The distance is shorter. The philosophy and the way of work is already in place. And there is a fantastic relationship between the people of Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, and the people of the United States. There is a lot of respect, and there is really a lot of appreciation because we have been 
literally living very close for many years. Now, at the micro level, which is a little bit of what we are talking about here, I think that Central America, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador has, have a great advantage in terms of, certainly compared to the rest of Latin America, uh, logistics, textiles. There are uh, uh, studies that show that if 10% of the textile production exported from China to the United States was to be produced in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, one million new jobs can be created just in the textile industry, just in those three countries. Give it, we have about 10% uh, uh, the size of the population of the United States. That one million is equivalent to about 10 or 12 million jobs in the United States. So the opportunity of creating 10, uh, uh, 1 million jobs in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador means that 1 million people have less temptation to migrate somewhere because they want to be closer to their families. And the same thing can be said, and the same numbers can be extrapolated in other sectors like medical supplies, light assembly, and by the same token, and here is a fantastic opportunity for US-based companies in infrastructure, whether it is roads, ports, airports, or as was uh, sort of mentioned uh, by, by, by Dante in energy. It, the United States now that has excess capacity of energy, why not think big? Why don't uh, connect the United States and Central America by pipelines or through CNG uh, using ships, whatever means possible to bring energy for Central America. Central America is dependent on the countries that provide energy, uh, concretely oil and gas, why not that be uh, the United States to provide it? That will further enhance our relationship. It will give the United States another important market to supply gas. It will give us more competitive ener energy prices in the region. And so it is part of that vision of the win-win-win. Because I think what DFC is doing, what President Trump is doing with America Crece, creates a new dynamic, a new dynamic. And I think energy, for example, can be a game changer for the region. I'll shut up with the following. There is an effort that, uh, for example, the Bush Institute is doing with people from the private sector, civil society, and other organizations of Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador to make an additional effort on digitalizing the economy, on using technology. And that's a fantastic endeavor. At the same time, there is a group of successful business leaders from Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, and the United States that are getting together and are soon to announce an endeavor, an initiative that attempts to build the private sector of the four countries into very concrete and strategic projects that have a double bottom line, a good return on investment, and a good investment in the community where those projects are being developed. So I am very encouraged by what the United States is doing, by the methodology that is using, by the channels that is using like DFC, CAVE uh, and the banks locally, while at the same time, I am very enthusiastic and optimistic about how the private sector is looking at the opportunity that exists today in order to create the jobs that will help our people take destiny into their own hands. Dante, please uh, jump in if you will. I, but before I, I'll, I'll note that uh, every U.S. school kid hears about the story of the Old North Church in Boston. The steeple of the Old North Church was rebuilt uh, more than a century ago with contributions from Honduran merchants uh, with that Boston community. I mean, that, that relationship goes back so long and it's so deep. Uh, Please uh, give us an idea uh, where you see some of the issues that Juan Jose uh, mentioned about mobilizing the private sector, getting them to do the, that, uh, you know, push that the second generation reforms at home to pull together uh, to tap into this market, please. Yes, uh, I mean, let me just go to manufacturing. I think it's, uh, that's, it's one fascinating sector. Um, you know, I learned that uh, uh, the Northern Triangle is the largest buyer of U.S. cotton. Uh, I mean, when you think about it, uh, you see South Carolina and uh, all these cotton fields. You, you, you wonder why is it that we are the largest uh, buyers? Because we actually 
to you know make use of the uh, trade preference, we need to use uh, uh, U.S. cotton to enter uh, you know uh, duty free to the U.S. So uh, one, what Juan Jose was saying is that linking you know this uh, this sector is vital, and uh, when you have the uh, you know these manufacturing companies uh, working in in Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, they actually, uh, they need to actually start, you know, getting this uh, um, network of suppliers in, in the region uh, with small and medium companies. Uh, I mean, I'm still surprised when I see the amount of women that go to these uh, manufacturing plants and uh, they actually, they work, uh, with incentives, if, if you come early, you get breakfast, stuff like that. And so they actually do a fantastic job. They're very productive. Uh, and uh, But then there are missing links. I mean, these companies want to grow, but then they don't find uh, the right amount of energy. I mean, uh, the the company doesn't have a, a reliable supply of, ener of electricity. Or uh, there are backlogs at the ports or you find uh, customs can be a bit complicated sometimes uh, locally. I mean, it's, it's not in the US, it's locally. So this linking of uh, small businesses to these larger companies is, is essential. Something we look forward uh, to learn from Taiwan, we are opening a, an office in Taiwan, is that they have this model of smaller companies that actually work uh, you know, together as a block and they actually uh, managed to create, uh, you know, this community of, of employment and, and quality products that you export, like uh, chips. So um, what I think we need to do in terms of, uh, um, uh, you know, next steps is how do we link these small and medium companies to these now successful, uh, full-scale uh, world-class exporters. Uh, so we need to link them somehow, uh, you know, even to produce uh, the bottom on, on a shirt. Probably you can do it locally. And if you manage to do that and do it well at a low price at, uh, with good quality, then you will be linked to this large company and, you know, you can link to this more global world. So we need, I mean, from the crisis, and I think there's this hunger from these larger companies to link with these small companies. So again, uh, this financing to these small and medium companies with uh, a guarantee fund uh, is a fantastic opportunity. We are, I'm talking like daily uh, to news, uh, you know, news programs in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador just telling them, go to your financial institution. It doesn't have to be a bank, it can be a co-op. And CAVE has the links to these banks, uh, to these financial institutions. So ask them, and if they say, we don't know, I said, call me, <laughs> give me, a, give me a, a tweet and uh, I'll get back to you because uh, these opportunities we're getting from, you know, a DFC and Taiwan, I'm, I mean, are just second to nothing. There's nothing even similar into the marketplace. So uh, again, I, I, I'm, I, perhaps I'm the permanent optimist, but I think uh, the art of a development bank is to uh, transform these challenges into opportunities. And, uh, you know, Cave is at the forefront of being there first. We take more risk. That's why I, I like Mauricio because he says, yeah, I, we know you move faster than the IDV. And, uh, but he has more money, but uh, still, uh, I think we actually uh, need to go into that line and, you know, show the world that we can do better with the right package uh, of financing behind it. We don't listen. I apologize for trying to mute uh, to <laughs> stop the distractions and then I cause more distractions when I unmute. Well, thank you very much uh, for the great discussion. Let me go to questions uh, from the audience. Um, uh, companies too often face uh, threats of violence uh, or extortion in the region. Uh, how important is it to ad address crime and violence to combat threats to prosperity? Uh, Andrew, should we ask a little bit about uh, you know, since we're talking about shared space with uh, and these uh, threats that emanate from 
really it's a transnational organized crime that has yeah. for so the last years really uh, uh, you know bedeviled uh, Central American institutions. How do we how do we break that chain? Yeah, security is critical for foreign direct investment in particular. I don't know how many of you ever encountered people who said they're not willing to travel to a particular country because it's insecure. It's one of the most common things as companies are looking to invest elsewhere. One of the things that has struck me also is that um, certain even small businesses that might have a dynamic leader who have key man insurance, who want to expand into a country, might not be able to travel to a particular country because the insurance company has made an assessment that it's too risky for them to travel to that country. This one of the things that people sometimes give DFC and other development finance institutions a hard time about is when we build um, big international hotels in countries. And I, don't, I think there are a few things that are quite as developmental in a country as doing that because number one, it gives an opportunity for a business person to say that they're going to be in a safe environment, makes them feel more secure when they're in the country and it helps bring in that business. Um, so that's really, really, really important. The governments have to do their part to increase security. Now, even if there's insecurity, small businesses are gonna continue. People are gonna continue to work in, in, work in their community because people need to make a living. But when it becomes too insecure, that's when you start seeing the migration. And people want to, maybe that the, the mother and the father will stick around, but they don't want their kids living in this country if they've seen plenty of crime and deaths and they just want to leave. I just came from living in South Africa, which is a, it's a very, very rust, robust and vibrant economy, but the insecurity was terrible. And there were people who I worked with who were victims of carjackings and, and crimes. And a lot of people wanted to leave, despite the fact that it's one of the most uh, dynamic and beautiful countries I've ever visited. And I think the same could be said for the countries in Central America, having lived there as well. I mean, people like to go to vacation in Central America for a good reason. It's a beautiful region, wonderful people, but we have to make sure that security is in place so that people want to travel there. Right, others have comments on that, security. Maybe, maybe, Roger, if I may, uh, security, we have to think about it more broadly. Is national security, is rules of the game and rule of law, and personal security. In our countries, regrettably, it costs about 20% the insecurity that exists. In other words, the cost of doing business can account for about 20%. It is a, not, a cost, not a good news, but if we can change that, that will give us a comparative advantage of about 20% as well. So the encouragement here and the message here is that the main role of governments, governments are created primarily to provide security for the people. So if the focus and the energies were to be on that front, entrepreneurs will do the rest. Excellent, other comments? Uh, I mean, just wanted to tell you, uh, Roger, uh, this is Dante. Uh, in terms of security, I think the, the three countries have made fantastic, uh, you know, advantages of uh, controlling uh, gangs and, uh, and, and the like. So uh, after being considered uh, a few of the most dangerous cities in the world, I think uh, San Salvador, San Pedro Sula have actually come down from that list because of that huge effort from governments to actually to, uh, you know, have a, a fight head on. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, you know, the fight against uh, illicit uh, trade of drugs, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's really difficult. And then you have, you need to coordinate uh, with different agencies to fend off against these terrible ills. Uh, but I gotta tell you, I have seen signs of progress in terms of uh, some entrepreneurs feeling more confident. Uh, I mean, just to, uh, mentioned in El Salvador, I think they, they, they had like 20 days in which there was no, no one murdered. So I, I think this is something that, uh, you know, for example, President Bukele should be commended for having a very strict, uh, you know, control of crime. And that helps and that's a continued effort. But again, as Andrew mentioned, uh, crime is just, it just goes the other way as uh, there is economic opportunities for people. So I think uh, the countries are moving in the right direction to, um, you know, 
look for more uh, jobs, and that essentially might mean less violence on the streets. Uh, thank you very much, Dante. That's a very uh, important message, and I'm glad we ended on that on that score, addressing the issue of uh, security of various kinds. I, uh, and I think Juan Jose is exactly right. Uh, personal security, security of investment, and, uh, and national security, all of them have to be addressed. I want to thank our panelists. Please stay with us, will you, uh, as I welcome uh, to make some uh, final comments, uh, closing our discussion. Uh, the acting administrator of USAID, uh, uh, Mr. John Barsa. I don't see him on the screen, but I understand he's with us uh, on the call. Uh, John is uh, no stranger to, to these issues. So we're having worked on Capitol Hill and the private sector at the Department of Homeland Security. He is the confirmed uh, assistant Administrator for Latin America and the Caribbean, and he has uh, stepped uh, up to bigger challenges on a global level as Acting Administrator of USAID. And uh, those of us who know him and very well are not surprised that he's uh, doing a remarkable job at that, at that level. John, thank you for joining us. I, uh, I know you have a few minutes, but I think it's really important to integrate USAID into this conversation. We have uh, Andrew Herskowitz, who's a detailee from USAID over to DFC, and he's comported himself very well, uh, stepping uh, in uh, for, uh, for Adam Bowler uh, to tell us a little bit about what DFC is up to. Uh, and, uh, you know, we can, we can create, uh, we can, I'm sorry, we can empower the private sector, but you also have to have the basic technical assistance, and the engagement, the diplomatic engagement, the coherent framework uh, for our relationships uh, in the region. Tell us about what how USAID uh, steps into that breach. Oh, absolutely. First of all, Roger, I want to say how wonderful it is to actually see you. Um, although I wish I could see you more in person, um, these in interesting, challenging times. Um, so uh, grateful for the opportunity to be here with you. I want to thank you, Roger, for leading us all through such a robust discussion today. And I want to extend my thanks to the American Enterprise Institute for hosting us. Um, I'd also like to con uh, congratulate Mauricio uh, for his election as president of the IDB. Uh, there's no better advocate for Latin America and the Caribbean, and this truly is a win for the Americas. Um, so it's a pleasure to join you all this afternoon to round out this discussion. As we've discussed, harnessing the private sector is vital to building a more prosperous and future, uh, prosperous future in Central America. The economic impacts of COVID-19 in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras have been undeniable. Uh, and this year alone, GDP in the region may drop by a stunning 8%. And we know that it's the workers in the informal economy that'll be hit the hardest. That's why the United States is working uh, with the region to respond to the pandemic and accelerate private investment. Private sector-led investment is the key to ensuring long-term sustainable growth, growth that allows citizens to thrive at home rather than attempting to make the dangerous journey north. September 15th is Independence Day for El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. And on this special occasion, I am proud to stand with our neighbors and commit to building a more prosperous future in the region. Through America Crece, the US is pioneering a whole of government approach to boost private investment across Latin America and the Caribbean. This initiative is catalyzing private investment in energy, infrastructure, digital technology, and supply chains throughout the region. We are bolstering U.S. private investment while serving as a counterweight to malign actors with less than charitable interests. At USAID, we are building on our strong collaborative relationship with the DFC to achieve these goals. As a member of the DFC's board, board of directors, I speak with Adam on a regular basis. Uh, making sure that our agencies are working together to mobilize private sector resources for sustainable development. USAID is working aggressively to counter the economic hardships brought on by the pandemic. If unaddressed, these hardships could result in urgent and widespread shortages of food and basic needs. USAID's technical expertise and on-the-ground presence, alongside the DFC's various investment tools, are a perfect complement to confront the pandemic and advanced prosperity in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. Each of our USAID missions has a dedicated DFC liaison, someone who leverages local networks to identify potential deals, to sharpen due diligence, and to capture valuable market intelligence. 
USAID is creating the conditions that make the region ripe for investment. We're providing technical assistance to complement DFC deals with partners like the Central American Bank of Economic Integration. We help local banks reach new borrowers, particularly smaller rural businesses that may struggle to access capital. We also work with these local enterprises to strengthen their financial management and operations to ensure that they are eligible for DFC financing. In Guatemala, our team has already identified and developed 22 potential projects with the DFC, adding up to a total value of $552 million. In Honduras, we're partnering with local companies to diversify their products, expand their exports, and create new jobs. For example, we're supporting JJ Agro, the largest potato supplier for Walmart Honduras, to diversify into strawberries and grow their local market. Our mission in Honduras has developed an extensive pipeline of potential deals in agriculture and tourism sectors, representing investment opportunities that total over $200 million. In El Salvador, USAID is assisting the government and the private sector to access financing from the DFC and create job opportunities. By working with the government to blunt the economic impact of COVID-19, we are reducing the pressure for Salvadorans to leave the country in search of better opportunity. Ultimately, we partner with the private sector to increase business opportunities and create local jobs so Central Americans can continue to build a secure future for their families and communities. A, private, a vibrant private sector and economy allows families to thrive at home without worrying how to put food on the table. USAID and the DFC play a critical role in propelling economies to become robust and resilient, where entrepreneurs and long-term investments can flourish. We gear up small businesses to succeed, and we support accountable government institutions that ensure fair competition and attract international investment. Look, in the face of COVID-19, economic resilience is more critical now than ever before. We're continuing our leading role in the global response to COVID-19, and we are leading the world in recovering from the pandemic and the knock-on effects. In Central America, we're providing state-of-the-art ventilators, and we're working to prevent and control infections in health facilities. Also, to address the econ economic impacts, we're creating jobs, increasing access to credit, and forming economic response teams to support small businesses, including in the highlands, migration-prone Western highlands. Our assistance reinforces who we are as Americans, the most generous and compassionate people of the world. We provide assistance that is high quality and transparent. On the other hand, China's contributions to fighting the pandemic are paltry. The bulk of China's COVID-19 assistance has been in the form of photo ops and faulty personnel protective equipment. Look, no other nation can match our generosity, our collaborative approach, or our long-term commitment. This is what we do, and this is who we are as Americans. Thank you for allowing me to join today's important event. In these historic times, we have the opportunity to revitalize how we do business and how we harness new ideas to reach more people in a time of profound need. There's a lot of work to do in the years to come. USAID looks forward to working with the DFC and the new leadership of the IDB to take strong steps to forward to advance regional prosperity and reverse the pandemic's impacts. Partnering hand in hand with the, with the spirit of free enterprise is foundational to our efforts toward a more prosperous future for all. Again, thank you, Roger. Thank you, uh, AEI, for this opportunity. Really grateful to be here with you. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. We appreciate your flying the flag for us today. It's very, very important. Uh, I uh, thank our panelists for a great discussion. Let me note that this is my, this is my last event at AEI as a visiting fellow. Uh, my visit is coming to an end after 15 years. Uh, I'll stay engaged as I'm sure you all are convinced. Anybody that knows me stays, uh, says, knows that I will stay involved uh, in the region and uh, from the private sector. I want to uh, definitely uh, recommend uh, the, our great team at AEI. You've seen Juan Jose Dabu in action today as a visiting fellow, uh, Ryan Berg as well, uh, and uh, Andres Martinez Fernandez, who helped organize this event. These are all great uh, thinkers uh, and doers, more importantly, uh, in the fine tradition of AEI. Uh, thank you again. I hope uh, that we've learned some things here. Uh, uh, from one another uh, and uh, shared some information with uh, our viewers that will be helpful to them so they can play a role as individuals in the economic 
and political future of their countries in Central America are great partners there. Thank you. God bless.